In this lecture, we are going to be starting our next module in the semester. So for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the meaning of meaning. And how we're going to focus that is we are going to be looking at symbols. So what I would like you to do, this is what we would do if we met in class in person, is I have 13 slides. And what I want you to do, I've also posted um, just the slides without the recorded lecture. So I would like you to pause the lecture right now, get out a piece of paper and a pen, and then go through those first 13 slides and write down what you see them as a symbol of. Then come back to the lecture. Okay, so hopefully you did what I asked. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go through these slides and we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the symbols mean. So the first one we are looking at here, this is an image of a dove, usually is a symbol for peace. Um, I intentionally chose one without the olive branch in its mouth. This dove with the olive branch is a pretty international symbol for peace. And this is also, the dove is also in uh, Christian religious art, it's also a symbol for the Holy Spirit. The next one here is the little image of fire. And yes, this is the little text emoji. So this may mean lit or on fire. That is more of the cultural meaning of it, the current cultural meaning of it. Fire also can represent anger, destruction, but it's also a symbol of rebirth and resurrection in transformation. So think of, you know, the phoenix rising from the ashes. So it's interesting that the one symbol can mean two opposite things, destruction yet rebirth. Next we have the butterfly. Butterfly is traditionally a symbol for rebirth and for transformation. Other ideas of that's a symbol of beauty and a symbol of nature. Here we have the no or the not sign. This is usually universally known as not allowed, not available, don't do this. It's a sign with more of a negative as an absence uh, connotation to it. Next we have the rainbow. Rainbows are traditionally signs of hope, prosperity, and equality. In today's society, the rainbow is a symbol for the LGBTQ community. Often it is associated with pride. Um, Proud of the idea of it associated with prosper prosperity um, goes along with the idea of, you know, what do you find at the end of the rainbow? This symbol, this symbol has become very prevalent in our society today. The modern interpretation of it is that it strongly aligns with the Black Power Movement or the Black Lives Movement. However, the clenched fist is actually a symbol that has been around for a long time. And it usually means revolution, solidarity, and support. Next, we have the White Cross. This can also have that dual meaning of both death and resurrection. If you uh, follow the ideas of Catholicism, it shows both. It can also show crossroads. It can show the intersection. And more of a cultural use, as some people identify with this white cross with the Ku Klux Klan. Here we have what it looks like a stop sign and that's usually what most people associate it with is with this stop sign meaning halt or to stop. Next we have a dragon. Dragons are actually one of the most revered symbols in Asian art. Usually they show strength, power, wisdom, and luck. Next is the swastika or the bent cross. Um, we're going to discuss this more later but typically those of us in this day and age tend to have this as a negative sign. Most of you probably put down Hitler or Nazis or even white supremacy. Next we have the equal sign, um, meaning equal, and this is actually the symbol for the human rights campaign. This is an organization that fights for equality for all humans. This also became a symbol for marriage and sexual equality. Next, we have the scales of justice. This is a symbol often associated with law and order. So here we have Lady Justice. She's blind because the idea is that the court system, justice, is supposed to treat everyone the same. 
In her right hand, she has the sword with which she will deal justice. And then in the left, she has these scales. And this is where she is supposed to be balancing right and wrong. Then we have the Star of David. Most people recognize this as a sign of Judaism or a sign for Israel. What's very interesting is also has a Christian and Catholic connotation to it. Because if you go to early Catholic churches, you're going to see, or Christian churches, you're going to see stars of David. Why? Because Jesus was a good Jew. So you'll see this represented in that religion too. And then the last one here, some of you or many of you probably aren't familiar with this one. But this one is what's called a circumpunt. And this is where we are going to start talking about these ideas of these symbols. As you've seen, just by looking at the last 12 to 13 slides, that here we're seeing these symbols all have some other meaning. So what is a symbol? A symbol is a mark or a character used as a conventional representation of an object, function, or process. For example, the letter or letter standing for chemical element or a character in a musical notation. Simply put, a symbol is a thing that represents or stands for something else, especially a material object representing something abstract. That's like that idea of justice. If I asked you to draw justice, you can't. It's an intangible idea. But when we do something like this, the symbol for it, it gives us something tangible to represent the untangible or intangible. So back to the circumpunt here. This is actually a symbol that has been used for many different meanings. It's the symbol for the solar system. It is the symbol for the eye of God or God, big G, little g. It's the symbol for the sun. It is the symbol for Ra, the Egyptian sun god. And it is also the symbol for the element of gold. So we see with the circumpunt, all of this is represented by this same symbol. Now another thing to play around with, when you look at this, between the three things here, I usually ask which one of these is red? Usually there's a pause and people are like, well, they're all red. If I asked you which two were physically red, you're going to say the red box and the word red on the left. Those are physically red. Yet the word red on the right, that is green, is also red. Why? Language, we could argue, is also a type of symbol. When you read the word red, it is pointing to the color red. You know and understand that. So in a way, again, language can be seen as symbols. So now we're going to start looking at some of the articles I had you read. The first is the accidental history of the at symbol. This was by William F. Alman. And this is interesting because we've already discussed um, many of the symbols. Most of us know and realize when I, if I'd ask you, what's the name of this one? You'd be like, well, it's the at sign, literally referring to where someone is at. Well, what's interesting, it doesn't have any other name like the other two symbols I've given you here. The one in the bottom left, that's usually people are like, oh, it's the and sign. Its technical name is actually an ampersand. And then the image on the right, its name, it's not a hashtag. Hashtag is a new development. It's either known as the hash or the pound sign, sometimes also the number sign. So the hash, that's how you get a hashtag. It's this symbol, and then it's tagged with something else, so hashtag. Um, the reason why it's called the pound sign is this literally was used in weights and measurements. So if something was 16 pounds, you'd write one, six, and then this symbol. But the at sign hasn't really had a name. The, the Calling it the at sign has been a pretty recent invention. It was called the snail by Italians, the monkey tail by the Dutch, and now this, this um, symbol that really had, didn't even have a name has become absolutely necessary in today's world. Why? Because of electronic communications. Try to send an email without this symbol. So what's interesting is we really don't know the origins of the symbol. Medieval monks, when creating manuscripts, remember these are the handwritten texts, 
One theory is they were looking for shortcuts and they converted the Latin word for toward, which is AD, to this symbol. So basically it's the A and the D is kind of wrapped around. So it was a quicker way of writing it. You didn't have to pick up your stylus. Uh, another idea is that it's for the French word for at, which is A with an inflection above it. Again, it's the idea that you didn't have to. It's the A and then the inflection is the tail. Again, you would not have to pick up the writing tool, so it's a quicker way of writing. Others see it, it's abbreviation for each at. And then the first documented use of it was in 1536, where a Florentine merchant, a merchant in Florence, Italy, used the at sign to denote units of wine called amorphe. These were our large clay jars of wine, and he used it to represent that. The first, its first prominent role was actually in commerce, and merchants use it to signify at the rate of. So an example from the text, you have 12 widgets at $1. That means uh, each widget is a dollar, so it's 12 at this price. So it's not you owe a dollar, 12 at a dollar means $12. Interesting, when typewriters were first invented in the mid-1800s, it did not have the at symbol. And so many people believed it was just kind of going to go away. There actually used to be a cent sign symbol, and that is no longer standard on any keyboards. Why? We just didn't use it. However, the at sign, this changed. Why? Because in 1971, a computer scientist named Ray Tomlinson was trying to figure out how to connect people through computers. Remember, this is before the internet. So what he was doing at this time, each programmer basically um, was typically attached to a single mainframe, but they were not connected together. So think maybe mainframes, maybe think Gmail, Yahoo, AOL, EDUs. Not exactly the same, but it kind of gives you that idea. So these individual computers were not connected to each other. So what Tomlinson was trying to figure out was how to address a message created by one person sent through the ARPANET, which is the precursor to the network or to the internet, to someone at a different computer. The address needed an individual's name as well as the name of the computer. And so he needed something to separate these two things. So basically, if I'm Jennifer Fraley and I'm working on Apple Computer, he needed something that said Jennifer Fraley, Apple Computer, but something that would separate the two because Jennifer Fraley, Apple Computer are two different things. Also, it could not be a symbol that was already widely used in programming. Why? It would confuse the computers. So he chose the at sign for these reasons. And so what happens because of this, that's how it became known as the at sign. So it would literally be Jennifer Fraley at Apple Computer. So because of this one usage of it, the uses of it through electronic communications, basically it saved the symbol from going into extinction. And now it is probably one of the most used symbols in the world. Think about how much you use it every single day. All right, moving on quite quickly, uh, I wanted to have a little discussion about emojis, because what are emojis if not symbols? Um, emojis aren't labeled, so the meaning of them is up to those who use them, but they can often easily telegraph some sort of idea. And so here I just have the image of the, the different face emojis. If I told you to pick one that represents angry, I think most of us would agree we're going to pick one of the one, the one on the bottom row. Um, laughing or in love. There's certain ones you're going to pick. So these also are symbols. They represent an idea. What's also interesting is emojis also very strongly reflect and have cultural ideas behind them. Think back to the second slide with the fire emoji, right? Fire emoji means something's lit. It's hot. Definitely a different idea than just the idea of fire. And you can think about things that, you know, a piece of vegetable as an emoji has a completely different meaning than the piece the vegetable does in real life. So again, these emojis are symbols. They are representing something else.
All right, then we're going to move on to the article called How the World Loved the Swastika Until Hitler Stole It. And this is going to play back to when I asked you earlier, you know, what your thoughts are on the swastika. Most of us, because we live in a post-World War II era, see it as a negative symbol. We see it as Nazis, Hitler, and even white supremacy. But what many people don't know is the swastika is actually a very ancient symbol. In the ancient Indian language of Sanskrit, it means well-being. The symbol has been used for thousands of years by Hindus, Buddhists, and Yanis. In America, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was actually a fad symbol, meaning it was very popular in, in um, the current culture, and was used for all types of things. In fact, the swastika was actually used as a good luck symbol. And here's a couple examples here. You can see on the left, it was used by Coca-Cola. Here's a swastika bottle opener. Carlsberg beer, it's on the label itself. The Boy Scouts used it. The Girls Club of America, their magazine was actually called the Swastika. And the Swastika was often used in American military units in World War I. But what happened is the Nazis took it, and because of this, almost all other uses of the Swastika came to a halt. So what happened, why the Nazis chose the swastika, is because in the 19th century, German scholars were translating Indian texts, and they began to see similarities between the German language and Sanskrit. So because of this, these German scholars took it as proof that Indians and Germans had a shared ancestry. And this shared ancestry included a race of white god-like warriors. They called them Aryans. These never actually existed. But because of this, right, they found the similarities in the language as a way of linking German heritage to the Indian heritage. And again, they created this race of white god-like warriors. What happened? Anti-Semitic groups also grasped this idea and they took the swastika as a symbol to create and boost a sense of ancient lineage for the Germanic people. So what happens is they took the swastika and transformed it into the hooked cross and a white circle with a red background. So what's interesting in this article, not only is it telling us about the history of the swastika, but it's also asking this question, and I want you to think about this. Can this symbol ever be redeemed? Meaning, can it ever go back to its original meaning of well-being, of a positive symbol, or is it forever going to be tainted by what the Nazis did to it? Um, in the article, a Holocaust survivor says that this is a symbol of fear, suppression, and extermination. And he claims it is now a symbol that can never be changed. Interestingly enough, after World War II, Germany actually banned the use of the swastika. And in 2007, they also tried to get a U EU, European Union, wide banned of it. It actually, that actually failed. Interesting, the swastika actually also does have deep European roots. It was used by the ancient Greeks, Celts, and Anglo-Saxons. The National Museum of History in U of U Ukraine in Kiev has many, many examples of the swastika and artifacts. But what's interesting is there is a carved bird which has a swastika pattern on it. And this has been carbon dated to 15,000 years ago. And many believe this carved bird was actually a symbol of fertility. So the swastika was linked with fertility. Single swastika began to appear in the Neolithic culture of the southeastern Europe about 7,000 years ago. And there are also clay pots that date to 14, or I'm sorry, 4,000 years ago with the swastika on it. Swastikas are visible as architectural ornamentation in the Greek key pattern. That is what you see here on the bottom of the slide. And it's also used wise, widely on tiles and textiles today. This Greek key pattern is very, very popular. Ancient Greeks also used the single swastika to decorate pots and vases. In the 12th century AD, they found swastikas around on a piece of clothing 
that they believe uh, was owned by a Slav princess. And swastikas and gold crosses were actually embroidered around the collar. And the idea was those were there to help ward off evil. So in modern days, there's actually a movement where some people are trying to revive the symbol as a positive symbol. The article talks about this idea. It's called the Learn to Love the Swastika Day, which was November 13th. And what happens in this was tattoo artists around the world were giving free tattoos of the swastika. Well, personally, I was like, okay, well, I want to know more about this. So the people who are going to get these swastika tattoos, I'm like, do they have to claim it's for a positive symbol and not the negative symbol? But the article really doesn't touch on it. But what the people who are trying to revive the swastika want to do is they say the swastika is a symbol of love and Hitler abused it. We're not trying to reclaim the Hochsgarten, which is the German for swastika. That would be impossible. Nor is it something we want people to forget. We just want people to know that the swastika comes in many other forms, none of which have ever been used for anything bad. We are also trying to show the right wing, the right wing fascists, that it's the wrong symbol to use for this. If we can educate the public about the true meaning of the swastika, maybe we can take it away from the racists. That, again, they're trying to transform it to a positive. They're saying we don't want people to forget about the Nazis and the negative use, but that it should be used for good and positive as it was originally intended. Um, again, in our modern culture, it's still being used um, often by fa uh, fa people, fascist or fasc fascism. Fascism is a form of far-right authoritarian ultranationalism, a uh, form of government. And we're also seeing it very prevalent in the United States as a symbol of white supremacy. So Freddie Noller, who was the Holocaust survivor they talked to in this, he says, for people who went through the Holocaust, we will always remember that the swastika was like in our life, a symbol of pure evil. He says it's good that people do learn of the other meanings of the swastika, but he says for those who survived or were affected by the Holocaust, it will not ever be able to be redeemed. And that's what I want you to do. I want you to think about that and think about do you think the swastika can ever be redeemed as a positive symbol, or do you think it has forever been tainted by what happened in World War II? Okay, now we're going to move on to the last section. I did include this article online. I didn't make it required reading, but you can read it um, because I think it's very interesting. And what we're going to look at now is symbolism on American money. And when you look at American money, it is full of symbolism, reflecting uh, values and ideas that, of the nation. So that's what we're going to look at it. And mainly this article, we're going to focus on symbolism on the $1 bill. So we are looking at the current, um, current edition of the bill. You can read the entire article and you're going to see how many different renditions there have been. Because we have to remember that money for a long time was not produced just by the government how it is now. States were producing their own money. Banks were producing their own money. Individuals were producing their own money. So it was all very confusing. It wasn't till later that the system of money was actually completely taken over and is now run by the United States government. So the only way you can get official currency is through the mint, is through the government. But anyway, we're going to look at symbolism on the $1 bill. And it starts very significantly with who is pictured on it. We have George Washington. Why George Washington? Yes, he was the first president, but Washington is widely and nationally known as a symbol of unity and trust. We also see the Treasury Seal, which is on the right-hand side of the bill, and I have it also a close-up of it on the bottom left here. Now, the Treasury Seal is the green one. Originally, the number of spikes around it that was supposed to represent how many states were in the Union. Interestingly enough, this was before the Civil War. They didn't change it because they always had faith that those states would come back in. Now, when you look at it, you can see the balancing scales. These are, again, meant to represent justice. The chevron in the center has 13 stars. 
The 13 stars represent the original colonies. And then we have a key emblem in the bottom. This key emblem, this is a symbol of official authority. Remember again, it wasn't till later that we had one central mint, one central treasury that produced all of the money. So this is a way of saying, yes, this shows the authority of the treasury to print it. Next, we have the Federal Reserve Seal, which is on the front and the left-hand side. And you can see I have an example of it on the bottom right. Now, what's interesting is larger bills now just have the general Federal Reserve Seals, but the $1 bill and the $2 bill still have the individual Reserve Bank Seals. So you can see in the larger example here, you see the letter A. So what that means is that means which Federal Reserve Bank is actually issuing the money. So A is the first Federal Reserve. So since it's first, one corresponds with A. That is there. And then you can see below it says Boston, Massachusetts. On the bill that you see the full bill, there is an L in there. So L is the 12th letter of the alphabet. So that would be from the 12th Federal Reserve in Boston. And then if you don't know this parlor trick, this is how you can make some money. So you can tell somebody, you know, bet them their $1 bill that you can guess what letter is in that circle. And so have them get out their dollar bill and put their finger over it, over this circle, and then amaze your guests by guessing what letter it is. Because you can see this is letter L, 12th letter of the alphabet, there are four 12s printed around this. If this dollar bill was A, like the example here, where the 12s are, there would be four ones. So that's how you know what letter's in that. So there's your parlor trick so you can earn some money. All right, moving to the back of the $1 bill, we have on here the Great Seal of the United States, both the front, which is a side with the eagle, and the back, which has the pyramid on it, which are shown. And so this is also, this shows you the Great Seal of the United States. Interestingly enough, this took over six years and three different committees to design the seal. This was finally put together by Charles Thompson, the Secretary of the Continental Congress in 1782. In this seal, this is literally the seal. This is literally the mark of the United States. And it's going to become very important because it is completely full of symbolism. So let's start with the front of this. On the front, we have, as Thompson described it, an American eagle on the wing and rising. And he said this meant the eagle flies freely, independent of any other support, much like the nation was. In its left talon, there are 13 arrows signifying war. And it holds in its right talon an olive branch signifying peace. Now, it's actually very important what is in each talon because the right side signifies dominance. So if they had switched it, if the arrows were actually in the right talon, that could actually be considered a warlike gesture. And interestingly enough, you can read about this a little bit more in the article, but there was a coin that was printed and they did flip-flop it. They actually put the arrows in the right talon and some European nations were very offended by this and said it was almost a warlike gesture. So that's why it's important even which talon it is in. The eagle holds a banner in its beak with the words E Pluribus Unum, which translates to out of many, one. And this is again a reflection of the United States, that out of many different cultures, many different colonies, eventually many different states, we became one United States of America. The shield on the eagle's breast has many meanings too. The blue band represents Congress, the 13 red and white vertical stripes represent the 13 original colonies. Above the eagle, you see 13 stars. This is supposed to represent a new constellation taking its place in the universe, much like the way the new nation was taking its place in the world. Even the colors are significant. Blue stands for vigilance, perseverance, and justice. Red, hardiness and valor in white, purity, and innocence. So using all these together are things the nation is supposed to represent. That's why these are also the official colors of the, the flag of the United States. 
All right, now moving on to the back, we have the unfinished pyramid. This signifies strength and duration, and the pyramid itself is composed of 13 rows. On the first row, you see the Roman numeral, numerals representing 1776, the year of the Declaration of Independence. Below that is a Latin inscription of Novus Ordum Seclorum, which means a new order of the ages, and this refers to the new form of government and signifies the beginning of the new American era. And then we also have what's known as the all-seeing eye. This is a Masonic symbol. Um, you can go on another branch and look at all the different Masonic symbols or Freemasons that are in these works, and you can get another level of meaning. But from this, we have the Latin motto, Anuit Copetti, and this translates to Providence has favored our undertaking. And Thompson claimed that this alluded to the many signal interpositions of Providence in favor of the American cause, meaning that there wasn't just one idea, right? But that this idea was notable and outstanding and that it was accepted by many. So that is the seal, Great Seal of the United States. You can see how almost everything in it, very symbolic to represent the country. So what's interesting is this did not originally appear on, the, on money. Why does it now appear on it? Because in 1934, the Secretary of Agriculture, Harry Wallace, noted he was looking at the seal and he noted the phrase novus ordum seclorum but he interpreted it as the new deal of the ages well he was very excited about this and he brought it to the attention of president franklin d roosevelt you have to remember roosevelt at this time his programs were called right this is during the great depression they were the new deal programs and so because of this, it seemed like the seal itself was speaking to FDR's programs. So they had the $1 redesigned and they put the seal on it. In the article, you can actually look where he was given a prototype of it. On the original one, the eagle was on the left and the pyramid was on the right, but he wanted those changed. And so you can see that in his little notations in the article. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is in the, the phrase, in God we trust. This started to appear on U.S. money during the Civil War. In fact, it first appeared in 1864. And part of the reason was why it appeared then was many people, you're seeing kind of a religious upswing in the United States. In 1956, Congress officially adopted this as the national model of the United States, and it first appeared on paper money in 1957. What's also interesting, in 1929, the size of all U.S. currency was standardized and, to re and reduced into the size we have today, and there became some popular motif. Portraits were on the front, and monuments and buildings were often on the back. Example of some of uh, these portraits have included, of course, George Washington, William McKinley, James Madison, Salmon P. Chase, he was a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and Woodrow Wilson. So you can see from this, just taking this dollar bill, all these different symbols and meanings all supposed to reflect back on the United States. Same with the Great Seal of the United States. Now each state also has its own seal, and here we're looking at the seal of the state of the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the, or the Kentucky State Seal. Um, it was first adopted in 1792. And one of the most frequently asked questions regarding the seal is who are the two men? The answer is pretty simple. The two male figures on the official state seal are symbolic. They are not specific men. Some people like to say the man in buckskin is Daniel Boone, and the man in the frock coat is Henry Clay. In fact, it's not. And what's interesting is the seal was designed, or it says adopted, but it went through many, many different changes. So what happens in the year 1792, the Commonwealth of Kentucky, which was less than a year old, the General, General Assembly basically approved an act to create the seal. The act stated that the governor was empowered to create the seal. However, they had some specific things they wanted on it, including two friends embracing, 
with the name of the state over their heads and around and about the following motto, United we stand, divided we fall. Under the seal, um, until the seal could be crafted, the governor was allowed to use his own personal seal as a, the seal of the Commonwealth. Well, what happened, they had the original design, and David Humphreys, who was a silversmith from Lexington, created the first official seal and press for the state. Unfortunately, this was actually lost and destroyed in a fire in 1814 when the Capitol building was destroyed. Now, the seal has changed many times. It's changed from two men, both in formal dress, embracing, both men being in the frontier buckskin, shaking hands. Other versions of the seal have shown two men clasping both of each other's hands. One of the most interesting images is that there are two men dressed in cloaks, embracing each other with little enthusiasm, which again, maybe that has Masonic ideas behind it. And other versions of the seal have shown the men with stove, top pipe, stove pipe hats, slouch hats, no hats, and all in various forms of embraces or hand claps. Also what's interesting is the state motto of Kentucky, United we stand, divided we fall. This was actually from a popular tune in 1768 entitled the Liberty Song. Kentucky's first governor, Isaac Shelby, was particularly fond of a stanza of the song which proclaimed, then join in hand, brave Americans all, by uniting we stand, by dividing we fall. And this became the official motto of Kentucky. In 1962, the General Assembly passed an act making the seal of Kentucky depict a frontier's man clasping the shoulder and shaking the hand of a statesman. So the idea of this was the frontier's man represents the spirit of Kentucky frontier settlers, while the statesman represents the Kentuckianas who served their state and national government in all halls of the government. And so you see with this, right, all of this meaning. And then underneath you see the flower. That is actually the state flower, the goldenrod. So the state of Kentucky's seal is actually honestly a pretty simple one, but again, completely full of symbolism. And so this is going to be important because the seals are actually going to play into an assignment that you are going to do later. Next time what we are going to focus on is we're going to continue our discussion of symbolism, but we are going to look at symbolism in art.